welcome to our tasting session. Thanks so much for coming along. The order of uh, this evening is we're going from here down to Kent um, to talk to Will, who's the owner and founder of Green Sand Ridge. And he's going to do a tasting with us, tell us a bit about uh, the gin. Then we are going to go and speak to Paul Jackson, who is uh, from the Gin Guide, and he is going to explain why Green Sand Ridge won um, an award with them last week. So it, he's going to uh, tell you exactly why uh, Green Sand Ridge is such an amazing product. And then for the really the good fun bit, we're going down all the way down to Cornwall, and we're going to meet Josh, who's waving at you there, and um, <clears throat> he is going to make. Um, some cocktails and hopefully if it, if all of you at home are well prepared some of you will be making some cocktails yes. as well so um i know i i know for a fact that people have got some uh, alcohol in front of them and they're going to be smashing stuff or or even creating some cocktails um uh, unfortunately i don't have those so i'll just be sticking to my gin and tonic but I'll, i hopefully after josh has done his um three different cocktails we can actually some, see some of your creations, although we can't taste them. You'll be tasting them. Uh, we can see them since <laughs> it's been successful. Um, uh, great to see that a lot of people have already been answering the poll, um, which is on the lobby page, which was uh, who has considered the environment when purchasing a bottle of gin. So, you know, Green Sand Ridge is the UK's most sustainable and the first um, uh, carbon neutral uh, distillery. And so obviously that's going to be a theme throughout what we're talking about this evening. And it's really good that a, a load of you have answered that poll already. And we can pick up back up on that later. Um, anyway, a bit of fun. Uh, we are, when Will is going to be talking to you um, after the, um, the, the uh, Josh session down in Cornwall, we're going to go back to Will. Will's going to be talking to you. <laughs> And he's going to um, say an unusual word three times. And you've got to pick up on this word. In the first person, all you need to do, type, type, in, the, um, type in the chat box, say um, who you are and what you think the word is, which is repeated three times. And I'll, it's not going to be distillery because he's obviously going to say distillery three <laughs> times, more than three times. We're talking about something which is slightly unusual, like wombat or something like that. So... So bear that in mind, bear that in mind. Anyway, um, the other thing which we're going to do is, um, I know that some of you have sent in questions already. Um, as, as I said at the end, um, when we do, do our cocktail making thing, we're going to go back to Kent. We're going to do a distillery tour with Will. He's going to tell us a bit more about the distillery, but then we're going to have a QA. and a um, Please, if anybody's got any questions, put them into the Zoom chat. Um, we've already got some questions from you, but anybody got any more questions? We'll try and answer as many questions as possible. And um, yeah, we'll try and make it as interactive for everybody um, so you can get as much out of Will as possible. Anyway, um, I think I've done that almost in record time, uh, all the housekeeping. Um, I don't think I've got anything else to mention at this point. So I think if Will is ready, we are going to go down to Kent, to the beautiful Green Sand Ridge Distillery. Ooh. There we have him. Sorry, Will. I hope I didn't catch you unawares. It doesn't look like it. it. Doesn't look like it. How are you, sir? Are you all ready? I'm very good. I'm very good. Excellent. Excited so, about this evening. Yeah, Will. We're up to people of fifty-one of us watching, um, which I think many more than that actually. So, yeah. Um, I hope you've got everything ready for us down there. Um, it's it's going to go like a dream, as these things always do. <laughs> great, 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 great. So right. um, far away with yeah. um, what you've got to tell us. So good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for giving an evening of your time um, to drink some gin. I know that's not the biggest uh, challenge you've had all cool. week, probably. Um, and actually, if your day's been anything like mine, with the kids like mine, um, you need a drink pretty sharpish, actually. I could have started at four o'clock. Um, so I think we're going to do things a little bit differently um, as regards to the tasting this evening. 
And what I want to do is just make a gin and tonic with everybody, just to kick things off. I want everybody to spend this evening with a drink in their hands throughout the session. <laughs> so rather than me answer a load of questions and waffle on as we go, um, and then get to the tasting, let's make a gin and tonic. Let's save a little bit for a bit more of a formal tasting later on. Um, and then we all get to share in a gin and tonic as we're going. Is that all right? That sounds perfect to me, Will. All Absolutely. Right. Smash one out. All right. Great. So I'm going to make um, a gin and tonic as, as I would always make a gin and tonic um, in the distillery or, or at home. And I'm going to immediately alienate half of the gang on this because I exclusively drink my gin from one of these. <laughs> I do. Does it matter? I do. <laughs> Does it matter? Controversial, controversial. So I do drink spirits and I do drink drinks from one of these. In fact, I've had a drink from one of these this week and it was an Aperol spritz, baby. But um, gin, I'm afraid for me, guys, it's in a highball and this is a beautiful crystal cup highball. So if there's one rule in a gin and tonic, it is ice, as in so much cocktail. Lots like, annoyingly, they can just see loads of ice in there. Don't give them from the ice. Yeah, and with your gin, we're going to make a little bit of a short measure today because I want you to save 10 mil for the tasting later on. So in goes the gin. Now I'm actually going to use 35 mil right there out of the 40 mil. I'm going to add my tonic and I'm going to use just a premium tonic, okay? No flavorings, nothing fancy. We're not making a cocktail, people. This is a gin and tonic, so a plain tonic, okay? Flavored tonics are great, and there are spirits I make that I use flavored tonics with, and flavored tonics have democratized cocktail making, which is all good, but this is a gin and tonic, plain tonic. So I've used all of the tonic I'm gonna use in there, and then that last five mil, that goes on top. Mm -mm. Get that smell of gin. Okay, so I do drink my gin with a citrus garnish, a lime, berry occasionally, but my preferred garnish is a key botanical, and that is a fresh bay leaf. And then I'm just gonna add a few juniper berries on top there. And if anyone serves me a gin and tonic, with anything fussy like juniper berries or pink peppercorns, and they don't give me a straw, they get very, very wound up. I don't want little berries in my mouth as I'm drinking. So a nice paper straw there. And that, people, is how I want you to be drinking a Green Sand Ridge London Dry Gin and Tonic. Cheers. Cheers to that, Will. Thank you very mm. much. I think that's going to be said that that's a very, very good gin and tonic and a recyclable straw as well. Uh, biodegradable, yeah, yeah, biodegradable, biodegradable, yeah, that's yeah. going to go in the, um, in the hot composter we have. We have a hot composter to break down some of the little um, uh, shot glasses we have that are made out of um, compostable plastic, but we'll come back to that. Mm. So I'm going to go into my gin in a little bit more detail later on in terms of tasting. But if you've made up that gin and tonic, there's two words people often use when they taste our gin and tonic. And those words are soft and clean. And those aren't words that I'm kind of picking out of the great gin just like lexicon that I want you to use. That is genuinely when people are here making gin or hanging out, those are the words people are using. Soft and, and clean tasting. And you'll notice a few other things. There's not a massive citrus hit. There's quite a big juniper. It's definitely a classic gin but there's this really kind of like green, floral, and um, woodland kind of herbaceousness in there. Um, and as I said, we're gonna come back in a bit more uh, detail into the specifics of our gin and what's in there. But we did have a working title for this gin of Field and Forest Gin. I actually went for London Dry Gin in the end, a classic. And there's reasons for that, which we might touch on later on. But if I want you to experience anything with this gin, it's a walk out of the distillery through the beautiful fields and into the woods of the Kent and Sussex Weald. And that's the emotive response I want you to get when you taste our gin and tonic. So we're going to come back to that in a little bit more detail later on. Hopefully you've got the 10 mil left in there for a neat spirit tasting shortly.
So um, I'm Will, and this is my <laughs> this is my life right here. Um, I founded Green Sand Ridge Distillery about four years ago now. But the dream, the little seed began um, many, many years before that, probably five years before that. So I've been a, a serial hobbyist in booze making all my life. For those of you um, old enough to remember in boots, you could buy those white plastic bins where you kind of opened a tin of something and poured it in, some water and yeast. And um, they were pretty rough old things. But actually the first one I ever made of those, um, my mum wouldn't let me drink it because I wasn't old. So I've turned into a distiller now. So what does that tell you about my growing up? Um, anyway, from then until now, I've been making booze all my life. Um, I've been foraging woodland botanicals, um, things like oak moss and infusing those into vodkas over the years. I've been brewing Flemish red ales with wild yeasts. I've been making cider from scrumped apples all around. Um, and so booze is just, booze making is just in my DNA. About, um, eight years ago or so, nine years ago, I decided that I, 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 for me, I'd had enough of the, the keyboard and the desk job, and I wanted to make something with my hands. And I wanted to take um, my um, passion, which is spirits and, and booze generally, and, and turn that into a, a life's work. So I started a master's degree in distilling at um, Harriet Watt University. And pretty quickly from there, I was like, well, if I'm insane enough to start a master's degree in distilling when I've just had my second kid, then um, let's, let's really ramp it up and um, let's find some money, let's find a premises, let's build a distillery and, and let's see if I can make it, make it work. So um, many, many years of hard graft and here we are. I'm going to show you around this beautiful place, but we are in the, in the wilds of Kent, um, in the middle of the, the, the woodland here in an old Victorian coach house, absolutely beautiful setting. And um, I'm going to show you around a little bit later on. So the first spirit I ever made many, many years ago is, let me get this right, in here. Rory, if Rory's on the line, this is up by your, your part of the world, Rory. This is Waveney Valley, cider brandy. Um, this, is, this is an apple brandy. So this is one of the first spirits I ever made. There is a difference between cider brandy and apple brandy. It's a bit technical, so I won't go into it, but this is apple brandy. And when I met my, um, my wife many, many years ago, um, her in-laws uh, live in a, a little uh, cottage in Norfolk and they've got um, about eight or ten apple trees and I was like what do you do with those apples and my mother-in-law said oh we make them into lovely pies it's like not anymore you don't so um, I started making cider with those and um, you gotta be you gotta kind of dance around this one because obviously distilling's legal if you've got a license so um anyway things might have happened um, and we have some lovely apple brandy there. And uh, in fact, the first gin I ever made was a, um, uh, an old rectory gin with the summer botanicals from, from their garden up there in Norfolk. So I've been distilling many years, fermenting many years. I know my trade. I got the kind of technical background in this master's in distilling. So um, I'm hoping tonight there are some really uh, probing questions. I want you to call out my BS. I want you to encourage me to call out the BS in the industry because um, once I've got a gin and tonic in me, uh, I've got a pretty loose mouth. Um, so uh, that's a little bit about the background of me and the distillery. If Green Sound Ridge is known for anything in, in the industry, it's the sustainability um, of what we do. My vision for building a distillery was part my hobby and my passion, part how I wanted to live my life, um, and part to prove to the industry that you can build a distillery that has a zero impact on the land. Distilling is a really, really wasteful process. We basically heat something up, we heat up a liquid in, in our beautiful stills here, and then we immediately cool it down. So we're using loads and loads of energy to heat it up and loads and loads of water to cool it down. And we're using huge amounts of raw produce to make it. I've got some barrels of apple brandy right here that I'll show you later. They are 200 litre barrels of apple brandy. And I often say to people, how many apples in one of those barrels? They are four tons of apples in one barrel of apple brandy. So if you think about all the hundreds and thousands of hectares of Scotland and Scandinavia that are given over to growing grain to the whiskey industry, 
that's agricultural land that should be growing food for people, right? Um, well, wrong, because actually they're growing whiskey, which is a carcinogen, okay? We're just gonna gloss over that. So ethically, I've got a bit of a problem with the energy and the water that we use in distilleries, and ethically, I've got a bit of a problem with all of the land that we give over to spirits production when it could well be used for food production. At the same time, we've got this massive problem in our society of food waste. So how about we build a distillery where the only produce we take in would otherwise be wasted, and then when we're distilling it and when we're making it, we don't use any resources that are gonna cost the earth and that are gonna persist for hundreds of years in the environment. So that's the kind of where I built this distillery from. We're considered to be one of, if not the sustainable, most sustainable distilleries in, in the UK. In fact, we won this year uh, a few awards. In fact, the, the Spirits Business um, Sustainability Award uh, 2019 and the Spirits and the, the Drinks Business Award for the same thing. So, um, you know, we've got this kind of external validation of, of being sustainable. And, and that means a few things. It means we're using waste produce to make our spirits. It means we're using 100% renewable power. We, we are zero chemical in the distillery. We take a waste stream and use the sugars in it to make alcohol. And then that waste stream goes off and makes gas for the grid or feeds local small holdings. We don't use any plastic. There's a couple of areas I'm gonna show you later where we can't rid get rid of it, but basically we're zero plastic. And we, we throw out about one black bin bag of waste equivalent every six to eight weeks. So that's the kind of headline figures. There's loads and loads of detail in that. and We might get into some of that today. Um, I want to talk a little bit about this, a few of the spirits we make. I don't have much time, but before we do, is there any questions coming, Phil? There have been a few. I didn't know how many to kind of fire up now and how many to fire up when we're doing our distillery tour. But um, yeah, we've, we've got quite a few from people. Um, and Can we take one now? Yes. Uh, well, from the top, um, how long did it take you to perfect your um, signature dish? Uh, signature dish? Signature, signature gin? Dish. Well, my Welsh rabbit. Yeah, um, yeah exactly. Your, your um, the, gin, the gin took about um, four months of work um, to get the, the botanical mixes right. Um, gin... Um, is this beautiful spirit where we've got botanicals from all over the world, but we don't. In this distillery, we don't. Um, we're slightly limited in our ethic of using local produce from the immediate area. So we are named Green Sand Ridge because we've got this line of hills going all around the, the Weald of Kent and Sussex. So we've got the Weald region here, and the Green Sand Ridge goes all around, and then you've got the North Downs and the South Downs. And we want to use flavors and represent the flavors of that area. So we don't have the luxury of using pink peppercorns and Madagascan vanilla and all these kind of esoteric flavors. We have the produce which is outside our doors. And um, so in terms of developing the recipe, I had my palette which is out there, which is a much more limited palette than a lot of distillers, but we've also got a much more limited set of flavors to work from and build up a, a, a classic gin. So um, I kind of knew the flavor profile I wanted to get to, and I knew what I was working with. But, but there's still, you can't shortcut a gin, gin making process, you know, to make a really good gin um, and make it really well, it takes a while. And um, one of the problems when you're making gin is that you get sensory exhaustion really quickly, actually. And so you, it's not like you can knock out recipe, recipe, recipe day after day. Um, you've got to, you know, if you really want to take time to consider what you're making and, and, and really taste it, then you've got to um, give your palate a bit of a rest. Yeah, we've all been there. We've all been through those tastings where you have the first sip. And you're going, my palate will not recover from that. So I can imagine being an actual the sixth day in, gin day in. Like the fifth <laughs> gin, I'm pretty sure they were the same. Yeah, exactly. So um, we, uh, we make seven spirits currently in this distillery. We, well, we've released seven spirits. We make gins, rums, fruit brandies, and whiskies, and we use um, the surplus produce exclusively in, in most of those products. Um, in this part of the world, in terms of 
waste in the system, most of the food waste um, in, in our system is at the farm gate. Well, we, we call it at the farm gate. Basically, it's at the farmers produce a lot of the waste because they're forced to in a way because of how we've built our food system. Not their fault, in fact. A lot of the time, other people's problems always fall to the farmer to solve. So in this part of the world, we've got a lot of fruit available to us and we've released four, uh, three fruit spirits so far. We've released um, the grown up version of the apple brandy. So this is my little baby from way back. This is our beautiful uh, aged apple brandy that we released. Um, we've got a plum brandy, which is a crazy spirit. Has everyone ha ever had a sliver of it before? Mm. There'll be a few, a few nods from the real spirit of files. Uh, so this is a plum brandy. Um, uh, double aged in marsala casks and bourbon casks and we have this spirit which is called raspberry ghost now there was another question that i noticed which is which flavors of gin are you thinking about doing in the future and i'm going to answer that in a little bit of a round way because it's an interesting way to think about the ethic of this distillery we don't make any flavored spirits in this distillery and that's a bit of a weird thing to say because the raspberry goes to flavored gin is flavored spirits but you know what i mean like if we get raspberries my first thought isn't eh, let's go and make a raspberry gin that's the most commercial thing to do but my thought process is what is the best way to use a raspberry that is the best spirit that i'm going to enjoy and for me raspberries and juniper I'm sorry, but that's not the winning combination. There are some great raspberry gins out there. I've enjoyed the odd one, but um, my favorite way of drinking raspberries is a German Himbeergeist, folks. So this is a Eau de Vie or an Eau de Framboise in your French. This is a single distillate of raspberries. There's nothing else in it. And so this is a really good illustration of how this distillery differs from other distilleries. We think about the flavor and what's the best representation for the produce. Um, the, all of the raspberries in this produce would have gone to waste, um, but you see it's clear, it's colorless, it's not pink and it ain't gin. So this is the pink gin, which isn't gin and it's not pink, but it's absolutely beautiful. It's got this like real vibrant raspberry nose and a lovely soft raspberry on the palate. You drink it with tonic like a gin and tonic and it's absolutely beautiful this is in fact available on gin foundry um and it's to my knowledge the only one of its kind in the uk um but I've, I've probably got that wrong but it's an absolutely beautiful spirit yeah it's certainly one of the most unique uh, spirits i've ever tasted it's stunning it's absolutely stunning when you you smell yeah. it the aroma knocks you out it's just incredible so intense but then the flavor is so, so interesting. It's, yeah, it's really, really unique spirit. Anyway, thanks so much, Will. We will come back to you in around about 20 minutes, if we mm -hmm. have time, maybe. I don't know. We'll see how, how well Josh keeps to his, uh, to, to his timings. But we are going to thank you for the time being and go to Paul Jackson from The Gin Guide who is going to tell us a bit about why you won an award recently. I think it was last week. Paul. Yeah, indeed. I will. Good to see you. Good Hello. to see you. Thanks a lot for coming on board. Uh, absolute pleasure. I think, uh, I think uh, Green Sand Ridge was the last distillery I had the pleasure of visiting before we all got uh, locked away. So, mm. um, uh, so it's uh, yeah, looking forward to getting back out. But uh, yeah, as I say, um, Green Sand and, um, and Will won the Spirit of Gin Award in the Gin Guide Awards um, this year, with the winners announced last week. And uh, I'll just quickly explain what what that means because the Gin Guide Awards has the blind tasting categories, but it also has the uh, Industry Choice Awards, and those are not open to entry they are uh, entirely nominated based on nominations from uh, industry experts uh, a lot of a lot of whom are uh, uh, in the room tonight so uh, thanks for the nominations um and um so i mean to achieve any nominations when any distillery in the world can be nominated uh, is is a cracking achievement but to achieve such a significant amount um that you've achieved the most in the world 
uh, is, uh, is, is absolutely outstanding. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a huge achievement. And, you know, not only does, uh, does Will make great spirits and uh, he knows my opinion on them um, <laughs> uh, very well, um, you know, the spirit of gene category is all about um, the approach to things around the gin and beyond the gin. So environment, sustainability, local community, and those sorts of things. And, um, and what, what Will does, especially in terms of uh, environment and sustainability, uh, is really a sort of example to the whole industry, as you say. And it's, you know, it's not, uh, you know, there's no BS if you like, there's, uh, as you say, there's, you know, it's not done for a gimmick, it's not done for a marketing ploy, it's that whole approach that you know, sort of embodies everything you do and it's all about, um, you know, kind of making quality spirits at the end of it as well. Um, so, you know, for me personally, and uh, I'm sure for everyone who, who nominated you, absolutely delighted to, to see you with the most nominations and to, to win the award. Uh, so, massive, uh, massive congratulations uh, for that. And um, yeah, as a, as a long time uh, Green Sand Ridge drinker, and um, I'll, uh, I'll back up the uh, ODB uh, opinions there. Um, which is absolutely stunning. Um, yeah, it was so great to come and see the distillery and you'll know, see it all in action, hear about uh, your plans as well. And, you know, there's, a, there's no, uh, no stopping uh, as well. You know, you're moving on to more things. So, um, you know, with the environment and sustainability side of things. So, yeah, brilliant to see. And uh, I'll, uh, I'll let us move on to, to Josh. Uh, I won't boast your ego too much more. Um, but yeah, incredible achievement. Congrats and uh, yeah, cheers from me. Thanks, Thanks so much, Paul. Paul. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, it's great to hear and good to hear someone else blowing um, the trumpet of Green Sound Ridge, which is definitely a fantastic distillery. So but let's go from um, London down to Cornwall. We'll bang our way down to Cornwall and uh, see what Josh has got in store for us. I think he's going to attempt to do three cocktails. Three. Is that right? Three cocktails. You said 15 minutes, we've got a timer and everything. Crikey, that's amazing. If every bar I went into was that precise, I'd be see, a happy man. When the alarm starts going off and I'm carrying on, then we know we've gone over. But, yeah. Um, yeah, my name is Josh. For those that I've met before, I'm sorry. Um, those that I've not met yet, I look forward to it. Um, Bit of background on me, just for two seconds, for about five, one minute actually. Uh, gin ambassador for various different gin brands, 16 years bartending. I know I look like a disheveled 12 year old usually, but I am 34 now. Um, kind of bringing that creativity with gin. A lot of the brands that I've worked with have allowed me to kind of really play with it. So when it came down to the cocktails using this gin, after tasting it, I wanted to get those A, sustainability kind of messaging across, but also working with those flavor compounds as well. So the first cocktail, without further ado, whilst I'm babbling on, is a straight serve. Whether you're using a straight serve style glass like this, or a martini glass, or anything with a stem rib, where really, you want to chill it down beforehand. So if you've got your glass in front of you, ice that bad boy up, get that cold whilst we're making the drink. Then this cocktail is a bit of a twist on a London's Calling, which is a classic cocktail. We call it Earth's Calling because of sustainability, because we're calling quirky and catchy like that. And we're using 50 ml of the Green Sand Ridge original dry gin. So if you haven't got a measuring jig like this and all these at the top here, you can just use a shot glass. The average shot glass is around about 25 to 30 ml. So do the math, I'm sure you're better than that than me. Um, juicing, juices. With this one specifically, lemon juice, I've pre-juiced it. It is actual lemon juice, not that horrible gif stuff you get. It's not a pancake, go real. You can juice it beforehand and keep it in the fridge. It'll last around about 12 hours before it fully starts oxidizing. Um, so this is pre-measured. 20 ml. With this one, a bit of sherry. So fino sherry, nice and dry. We're adding that lemon juice to obviously accentuate those citrus notes in the gin. Also to add acidity. This is gonna give a bit of that nuttiness that's gonna work with those cob nuts, obviously, and that solidity that you're gonna get through with it. So 25 of this bad boy. If you are using anything else, 
like, um, I don't know, Amontillado or, or other sherries, just play around with it maybe. The measurements might be a bit better, less or more. But that's just going to give it a bit of dryness as well, similar to what the Mouffe would do. Adding a bit of sweetness to that and a bit of complexity and also matching up with the honey that's one of the botanicals that Will uses in this gin. This is Monin Honeycomb Syrup. I'm using it because it's delicious. Uh, you can buy it, it's Monin. Most coffee shops have probably got it, but I got it sent for free, so I'm using it. You can not get this, make some honey water. I know Emma Stokes and a few others have made some today, but you can do equal parts honey to hot water or boiling water, or two parts water to one part honey, depending on what ratios you want. But that'll add a bit of sweetness, obviously. I'm just using 10 mil of this. If you're using the honey water at home, if you make quite a thick one, five or 10 mil will do it fine. So, you, so you're saying that you can make the honey water at home as, as well as just buy it in. How would you, how would you do that? So would you take honey, so yeah. your basic honey, you can use your rose stuff. I'd recommend buying something a bit nicer if you can. Yeah. But then you're mixing that with water, so you're making a honey water. If you get that honey itself and just pour it straight into a cocktail shaker, the odds are you can add ice to it, shake it, pour the drink out, and the honey's still going to be in there. Because it's yeah, sure. You know, so it's just to bring it down a little bit. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of figuring out your measurements and your complexity of sweetness to bitterness, etc. You've got to get it just right. So sometimes with making homemade syrups, specifically with things like honey, if you're going to use something like lavender honey or you know, heather honey, something like that, yeah. very good to kind of play around with your ratios of water to honey to get it right. You want to be able to pour it out of a bottle, ideally. Um, but you don't want it to be super, super thin and just add a little water to it because you're yeah. adding solution when you're shaking it with the ice, right? So you're wanting a little bit more um, flavour than you would get with just a simple sugar syrup. You're just wanting that bit more depth of flavour, right? Yeah, it's yeah. the same with quite a few cocktails that you get that, I don't know, well, uh, mojitos, for instance. The amount of mojitos you see, or twists on mojitos you see in bars where it's apple mm -hmm. vanilla. But it's just literally as simple as pouring apple juice in it instead of using sugar syrup, you're using vanilla infused sugar syrup or vanilla syrup. Yeah. So just to kind of add on, we're adding a bit more complexity to it. And like I say, it's kind of boosting those, the, that kind of ever so slight sweet finish that this gin has got. Last ingredient going to this bad boy now is a, another homemade ingredient. Hopefully you've made it. If you haven't, make some please. Uh, it's literally a saline solution. So similar to what we just talked about with the sugar and water, but you're using salt and water instead. A lot of the time with salt in cocktails, people go, that's weird. Salt as a flavor compound, as a, as a, as a structure, it adds, or it, I always say it makes a flavor taste like the true version of itself. It brings out huge flavor. So you only need a few drops of that. You know, this is quite a, quite a strong, powerful one. With this one, I've infused it with lemon zest. So with a sustainable in mind, sustainable factor in mind, that lemon, you could put it in half and juice it. Great, you've got lemon juice. Zest it first. Yeah. Then squeeze it. You've got two ingredients, right? So that is literally salt. Water, lemon zest, done. Too easy. I and you can you can keep that for a while, right, Josh? You can yeah, you can yeah, keep that in your fridge for for a while. So it's not yeah. again, it's not as if you chuck it out after you, you use one bit. Yeah. It's good to keep things fresh, you know. But at the same time, these little bottles that you can buy online. Well, this is actually mm. after a bottle of bottle of bitters are finished. I just emptied it out, so I've got the nice little pipette as well. So you can, you know, there's lots of different bits these days that use the little pet things. That just, it's just a handy thing to have, you know? Yeah. Instead of just chucking it straight in the recycling, just reuse it, upcycling that. Yeah. Chill glass, all the ingredients in there. Everyone ready? Yes, Josh. Yes. Well, I'm not, but people are. Hopefully everyone is. Yeah. Ice, always use loads of ice, as Will said. Whenever you're ordering a gin and tonic, ice on the floor down there now. One drop. Um, whenever you're ordering a gin and tonic or any kind of longer style drink, the more ice, the better. If you have two ice cubes in there, that carbonated drink is going to move it around. It's going to quickly turn to water, giving you a watery, flat drink. Loads of ice makes you a nice, sparkly, wonderful, tasty, effervescent, chilled drink. If you haven't got a cocktail shaker, you use a jam jar, protein shaker, anything you've got that's got a lid. Simple as that, really. I've got a cocktail shaker, so I'm using it. Give it a whack. Shake it hard. This is the part where someone else talks while I do this. Yeah, I'm looking through everything and, and, and there are quite a few people making. Are there quite a few people shaking? That's good to see. I can't say I'm leading by example. I'm just sitting here drinking a gin and tonic, but um, it's good to see so many people attempting it. Very good.
Some people have got the, all the professional equipment and everything. Well, I'm bouncing in there. Yeah, there we go. So Back what we're looking at really there, from a kind of quite a basic point of view really, is if you've got feelings left in your hands, which I thankfully have, um, you feel it's quite cold. Usually you get this kind of ice on the outside of it, around the outside, around the outside. Uh, that's good. You want it to be as cold as possible, but after you're shaking it, you want to get it out there as quick as possible because now those ice blocks that you had, or ice cubes you had, have now turned into ice particles. So you don't want to leave it in there too long. This is called a Hawthorne strainer. This gets the big bits of ice out. If you haven't got one, a little trick for you at home, you've all got a whisk, it does the same thing. All that's doing is blocking the big bits of ice from getting out. Fine strainer, just gets the small bits of ice and the bits of lime or lemon particles. You want to just strain that out into your chilled glass. If I was making this in a bar scenario, and it's the first one of the night, before I pour that into that glass, I give it a quick taste first with a straw. Not drink out of it, obviously. You just pop your finger on the end of it to be able to keep it in. I'm sure you've all seen people do it. But reason being that you can then adjust it before you put it into the glass. Because right now, that liquid is as it's being served, right? It just needs a garnish. But beforehand, you could have put a bit more sugar, a bit more citrus, or even more salt in there. Or if you will, lots more gin, obviously. But the, the, Josh, it's right that kind of you've got to think of cocktails as having that balance between sourness, sweetness, and whatever other um, ingredients you're putting in there. You've always got to have that balance. You don't want it to be overly sweet. So that's why you taste it to kind of get that exact balance right. So you put in a bit more sugar or you put a squeeze more lemon into it or lime or whatever, right? Yeah, just adjusting as you go, really. So if you know, for instance, that you're making a drink for your partner or your friend or a group of people after COVID, obviously, don't, don't so keep your social distancing, folks. Um, that, that moment where if you know someone's got a sweet tooth, you're going to serve them a sour style drink, like a sour, which is balanced, it's just a weird name. Um, if, they know, if you know they like it a bit sweeter, then make it a bit sweeter for them, you know? Same for yourself. If you, if you don't like a big fat chunky red wine, don't drink it. But it's that moment where when you do taste it, if you know how it should taste, like a classic cocktail, for instance, where a lot of these style cocktails, twists on classics come from, once you've learned those basics and the understanding of classic cocktails, it's very, it's a lot easier, not very easy, a lot easier to start, start building on your own flavors, I guess. Um, so yeah, it's just quite nice to just always taste them. Always taste them. This isn't a foreign cherry. I ate them yesterday um, and I put them in a smoothie as well. So this is a raspberry that was frozen. Sadly, because even though I'm in Cornwall, I didn't go for a walk today, so I didn't go foraging, sadly. So yeah, just finish off with a little raspberry. You can add other garnishes to this style drink if you like, but for me, it really does bring out the flavours that are in this gin, like that cognac moment, reminiscing that, and all the other ingredients that you've made at home, whether it be your honey, again, another ingredient, all that salt, all that balance, right? So cocktail number one down, it's calling. Cheers, folks. Cheers. Chin chin. Chin chin, everybody. That is not rubbish. That, that's rubbish. Is. Right. One down. Two to go. So, this next one, gin tonic. Mm. This next one is super simple for those folks that are at home now saying, I haven't got Tia Pepe or whatever. No issue, no problem. We've got you sorted. You've got a jam jar. If you haven't, eat those pickled onions or whatever you've got in jam jars. Jam. Give it a wash. We're using that. This cocktail has got, boom, jam in it. Jam Collins. So this is strawberry jam or conserve. Bit sweet. But two chunky bar spoons straight in to your jam jar, aka your cocktail shaker, which is uh, what you're going to use it as now. Get it in there. Next up, lime juice. Again, I've squeezed this. With the lime juice, you've got to be quite careful as well. It does turn quicker than lemon juice. So like in the bars that I've run in the past, for instance, it was always that make less lime. If we need more the the, towards the end of the night, we'll make more. But you don't want to spend half an hour juicing these little limes that turn up and then at the end, there's be loads left because you're not going to use it again. So about like keeping it fresh. So if you can squeeze this on the spot, go for it. I've pre-made it because it would have took about 10 minutes for me to squeeze them because these ones from Coop aren't great and you can't forage limes at the evening projects at the minute because it's closed. Bang, 25 mil. 
obviously because we don't mess around here at propping up the bar which is the name of my company feel free to add us on instagram when i finish the website because i'm currently making it and never made one before um, you can go on that as well but 50 mil of that gin green sand ridge ice it up i have washed my hands don't worry Ice it up. This ice has come straight out of the freezer, so it is ice cold. So whilst that's just sat right there, I'm going to do something a bit cheeky here, which is make the third drink, because I've only got about four minutes left. Third drink is a martini. A martini is all about how you like it, how I like it. But I do like mine dry. Dry means less vermouth. Wet means more vermouth. There is a, uh, loads and loads of documentation to where it came from. I'm not going to go massively into history for various reasons, one of them being that I've only got 15 minutes and I speak phenomenally fast, but I don't want to confuse you. So I'm only going to put about 10 mil of dry vermouth in there, and I'm using Naughty Crap. The reason I use this is because I've always used it. One massive tip with this, vermouth in general, sweet, dry, medium, whatever you want to class it as, and to your Pepe, always keep them in your fridge. Treat them like wine, otherwise they will oxidize and go off and you've just wasted 15 quid. That's not sustainable, is it, though? Bang. Ice. Blah, blah, blah. Just a boy. Stay. Don't you fall. And Josh, would you say with ice, the more the better, usually? Always. Yeah. Always the more the better, yes. yes. It's, it's always that kind of, like, factor that you can have in of... I guess people always see it as, like... It's going to be that little bit, it's going to be horrible. The more ice, I don't want that much ice, I'll get more booze. You never get more booze at a bar when you ask for less ice. It's fat. Exactly. It's just yeah. done. You don't. You just end up with a watery drink. Yeah. And like a cold martini is much better than a warm martini. You can honestly trust me on that one. I know that's a trap. And, and at home, what, do you just have ice? Um, do you make your own ice or, or um, do you just buy it in? It's a great question. So the answer to that is I've got a cool, unique technique. This one I did buy it because I put the water in there a bit too late and the, I think the freezer got left open a little bit. So what I use is my Yorkshire pudding tin to oh, fit fantastic. into my freezer. And it's also got a big block. Like, that's 15 minutes, by the way. They come out like um, hockey pucks. So all yeah. I do is take a fork or a sharp knife, put it on the side, don't touch it with your hands, you're going to cut yourself. Give it a quick whack. That comes out as two half crescent, like half moons. They fit perfectly into cocktail shakers and also your big gin balloons as well. Three of them in a gin balloon, A, it looks banging, but you can also have that moment where you infuse the ice. Mm. So you put a raspberry or a blueberry or a bit of mint in the ice as it's freezing. And then when you put that into your glass, everyone goes, wow, look at that, that's amazing. And it tastes nice. So give this a shake, give this a stir. You can do it at the same time, go for it. I'm not showing up, but it's gone over time. Day. Don't fall now. Just to finish this bad boy off, all I'm doing is adding a bit of ginger beer. You can use ginger ale if you want, if you prefer. I'd say use good quality though, don't buy cheap. You can put good gin in it, you can use a good mixer. I don't want to see people buying horrific mixers as well. Blah, blah, blah. Cheeky mint sprig. There's no such thing as just a mint sprig, it's got to be cheeky. Give that a quick stir to lift that off. Boom, boom, boom. Sustainable straw wheel. Got you sorted, mate. That goes in there. Along with that mint sprig. One cocktail down. Three chilled martini glass. In your martini, you can he either have whatever you like, really. I know there's a few people that are watching now that will have things like uh, peated whiskey rinses or lime zests in there. But for me, I always prefer a nice big chunk of grapefruit. But for argument's sake of everyone being happy, I'm going to use lemon today. So when you're putting your lemon twist into your martini, you've got a few different options. Uh, I'll tell you them, and I'm going to sip on this one and enjoy it, because I'm going to go over time by quite a lot. And I can just have on. But you can either uh, make a nice big twist, like you see in the old school kind of films, and those beautiful, massive big long twists that you see in some fantastic hotel bars and bars around the world. But... Obviously, that's sat inside that drink infusing the entire time. I like the idea of really feeling what the gin is talking to me about. So for me, I just cut a little coin like that. You do get more out of the lemon as well. And then all you need to do is just express the oils onto the surface of the drink. 
just by squeezing it gently. You know, like in the films or like every cocktail scene you see where someone's got a big orange twist and they're cosmopolitan, it's boom. It's just doing that, but without fire, basically. Just squirt that on top, give it a quick rim around the glass, and then a good tip to do is wipe it onto the rim of the, the stem of the glass as well, because between 75 and 90% of flavor comes from your nose. I've read that somewhere, it's probably not true, but after you've had a no. sip, and that smell from that lemon, another weird fact for you, fun fact number two is, you touch your face quite a lot. It's somewhat ridiculous, like 30 times every three minutes or something, but simple as that, or that, or this, or on your phone, that smell is now on your fingers, so it's gonna bring you back into the drink. So every time you have a little sip, it reminisces that moment. It's always bringing you back into it. So that was three cocktails in bang on 15 minutes, that by the way. Josh, you're absolutely smack on time, uh, as are most uh, British Rail trains as well. Uh, um, fantastic. Thank you so much, Josh. That was really amazing, uh, really informative, and I'm sure those people at home making those cocktails have got some really good examples to show us. Um, can, can, can we quickly flick through some of the people who have got some cocktails? Just hold them up. I haven't made one, but people make... Oh, my goodness me. Crikey. There are some good examples. And a lot of you were quiet. A lot of you were, were not shaking on, on camera. And I can see... Crikey. There's a lot going on. Impressive. Impressive. Really impressive. Um, Will, did you make one? That looks like, that's a massive glass, that one. <laughs> that's a massive Look at the size of that glass! It's huge. Huge, huge, huge. Well, thank you. Yeah, again, thank you so much, Josh. That was really great. No, absolute pleasure. If anyone has got any questions, feel free to reach out and I try to answer as many as I can. So we're going from Cornwall all the way back to Kent now. Uh, to Will, and we are now, I think Will's going to take us on a wonderful distillery tour. He's going to yeah, so we have a bit of a wander around. Yeah, he's going to explain to us all sorts of things. And Will, before we can start, I want to know what that squirrel is behind you. This is, um, this is Terry Nutkins. Yeah. Um, Terry Nutkins is our distillery mascot. It's not the... Okay, yeah. Not the distillery manager, the distillery mascot, right? No, no, the distillery mascot. When my daughter hasn't stolen it back and is sleeping with it, um, Terry's our, Terry's our uh, yeah, distillery mascot. And um, in fact, one of the charities that we, we've got some um, specific charities we support, a very small amount of our charitable giving goes to the Red Squirrel Survival Trust, um, which is, yeah, protecting red squirrels. Red squirrels. That's yeah. there. <laughs> Too many martinis there. <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> All right, so I'll show you around the distillery a little bit, and then we'll come back. I'll talk about a few of the botanicals in our in our gin in a bit more detail, and then we'll have some some questions. So this is our still. This is an Arnold Holstein still. For those of you that um were talking with David at Manly Spirits um, a couple of weeks ago, they've got the same still. Coincidentally. Um, to make their, their gins in. So they're just fantastic stills. Um, I use, chose this for a couple of reasons. One is that it is really flexible. We make brandies, rums, whiskeys, gin, all sorts, and this still can handle it all. Um, and the other, question, the, the other reason is, is it's incredibly efficient still. So both in terms of its energy use, we use electric fired still so that we can use renewable source electricity um, but also in its cleaning it's clean entirely with hot water that is a byproduct from the distilling process itself so if you want to have a look inside this um, still here oh, goodbye Terry um, I've turned it on and here we go I don't know how much of that you could see but um that's uh, boy, that's the inside of the still. Um, it looks sometimes a little bit dark in there. In fact, the oxidization on the inside of the still isn't actually an important part of the distillation process in terms of softening um, the spirit. Copper is used in stills, if you're not aware, because copper breaks down sulfur compounds, and sulfur compounds taste meaty and sweaty and oily. Um, and so we don't want those in our spirits. 
sulfur breaks down those those compounds and so that's why we use copper in stills actually originally it was used it was soft so you could make it into these cool shapes but um now we use we we know that it has this catalytic effect so this is a rectifying column it can dial up or dial down the dis distillation power and this is a condenser cold water um out of the mains for now cools the spirit from a vapor back into a liquid and then we collect it through the here. This, this measuring tool just allows me just quickly by eye to, to look and see what alcohol um, uh, strength is coming out of the spirit, uh, out of the still. There's some other quick dials measuring temperatures around here. It's just, it's not accurate. It's just when I'm looking at the still and adjusting it, it's just something I can look at really quickly and know what's going on. So for the moment, in, in our 2019 sustainability report, if you downloaded that from our website, um, we identified our water use as one of one of the things we need to address this year. So we have just, and look at our Instagram tomorrow because I'm going to be posting a photo of it. We've just started excavating an enormous hole in the, in the land outside. And that is going to turn into a wildlife pond. Um, we're a really rich uh, area of newts and dragonflies around here and dormice and things. So we are building a wildlife pond that's going to supply all of the water, cooling water for our distillery. So we'll go from using about 160, 70,000 litres of water a year, just cooling to zero. So that's going to be really good. We got a couple of grants for that from European Union um, environmental um, uh, grant bodies. So. Um, they kind of see the benefit of that. And we're running that as a research project with uh, Harry Watt University. So we'll be sharing all of that good stuff with other distilleries. So we've got some barrels in the background here. These barrels are just um, things we brought back from our long-term storage that we're going to use in the next six months. So we don't really store much here in terms of casks of spirit. We send everything away. It's, it's safer that way. And there's various regulations which mandate us to do that in this country. But we've got a, a, a kind of... A, a, different barrels here. Now I'm using barrels in a colloquial term. These are all casks, okay? This, this is a barrel and this is a butt, but they are all casks, okay? That's a sherry butt, that's an X sherry butt, and we're aging some gin in that for our PX aged gin. So over here we got uh, our botanical library when people come and make gin in the distillery. They can select from all of these different botanicals and just a kind of nice little display up there. And you can see this is a really, really high ceiling room. When I got this place, there was, a, there was a ceiling in here. So one of the first jobs was to get up there and stamp the ceiling out. And then we've got plenty of space for this beautiful still. Ain't she pretty? Yes, indeed. So um, this is, if this is, uh, this is um, party in here, then the business is through next door. And um, as we go through, we can see, well, we've got a heat exchanger here. So in our, or in my definition of zero waste, I include energy. So when we flush the still, so when we open this big handle here and loads of 90 degree liquid comes out, well, that includes loads of energy and it includes loads of biomass. And both of that we want to use. Um, but if we send the hot stuff to the biodigester, well, it's just going to kill all the bacteria, but it's also wasting that energy. So we pump all of that waste into this store this is an insulated store it will store the heat energy for up to three days and we can use that in a variety of different methods and and you can look down there and there's all sorts of pipes and, and levers and if i remember correctly which ones are closed then we can recover all that energy either pumping new things back into the still or preheating fermentations things like that so we've got some more casks here these happen to be all rum in these casks and if we turn around we've got some little blending tanks so this is a water tank. Um, we don't talk about finished water in spirits that much, um, but it's a little bit of a messy topic. Whenever we cut a spirit, either from barrel strength or still strength down to bottle strength at 40 or 42, 43, we always use completely demineralized water. Any minerals remaining in the water would actually precipitate out of solution and form a sediment in the bottom of your gin. And that ain't classy. So um, we use reverse osmosis and various purification processes to remove all the minerals in that water. That means that it's completely characterless. So any spirit brand, especially gin, saying their water gives a flavor component to their spirit. Okay. So we've got a couple of blending tanks here. We take 
new make spirit, either from our cast or our spill, and the water from our purify purifying system, and we're blending down. So we've got gin in here, and we've got sanitizer in here, because that's what we're all about these days. Um, so let's come through into here a bit more. We have nice big room. You can see when we had more space in here, we had a wood burning stove in here. It wasn't a pretty, particularly good, good idea in the first place. We ran out of space, so it had to go. So it's now freezing all the time in here. Um, this is a big fermenter. I do most of my fermentations outside, um, especially fruit fermentations. When fruit's fermenting, the yeast that are natural yeasts on the fruit are ideally suited to the time of year that they ripen. So fruit ferments beautifully outside in ambient temperatures, cider all through the weekend. Uh, rum, we use wine yeast. So we've got to control the temperature really carefully. So we ferment our rum inside in this. This is a 2000 liter rum fermenter. And I'm gonna climb up to the top and... Don't type in. Please, Will. Careful. There's some, that's ready to go. That's ready to be distilled, that rum. Sitting there at about 11%. And it smells pretty boozy in there. Actually, if anyone else is uh, finding themselves procrastinating in this period of isolation, that should have been distilled a couple of weeks ago. So, sorry about that. Uh, okay, so we're over here. We've got a pallet of bottles. This is the bottling area. And if you come over here, you can see straight out of those blending tanks we were just looking at into the bottle filler. We have a labeling machine over here. I really ill-advisedly did all these fancy labels around here, which have to be done by hand. So we've got a little label rack up here. You can see all these beautiful colored labels for all our different spirits up there. And then we're, we're packing over here. And we've got a, a little tin. We use um, these, these um, uh, shrink viscreens, they're, they're a, a non-plastic cellulose uh, cap to go over the top. So that all happens. Things get packed over here. And then we've got um, bags of juniper, boxes of spirit ready to go out. We've got some sanitizer ingredients down here. This is our, some of you got some um, gin in the mail in bubble wrap. Don't think we're using plastic. Oh no. This is the uh, the, the box of shame. Whenever we get sent bubble wrap by suppliers we keep it and reuse it where we can we've never actually bought any but uh, we use bits and pieces where we can um, and I, I was just mentioned in passing earlier on we've got one one piece of plastic we use in the distillery and that's this stuff this is a strapping which goes around pallets actually m most of what you get in the industry is this stretchy unrecyclable plastic well we put these cardboard things around the edge of the pallet and then we've got to use a little bit of this to secure it. It's the only thing we can do really. But that stuff is recyclable if the people we're sending it to bother to recycle it. So up in the roof space there, you can see a couple of lofts and um, we've got kind of cardboard, all our cider pressing stuff stored up there. And um, well, through that door through there, you've got the unexciting bit. You've got kitchen and toilets and stuff like that. But yes. that's what we've got going on here. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Will. That's uh, a very, um, yeah, interesting tour around. It's amazing how much rum you've got on the go there. It's um, hopefully that yeah. will produce a fair bit of rum. So you're saying it's eleven, uh, sorry, twelve percent at the moment. How much will you actually distill out of that? How many bottles do you reckon you'll get? So out the of rule that? of thumb in distilling, if you want a rule of thumb, is that if you've got a, a ten percent wash, which you wang in your still you get a 10% of the volume out of the still. So if you've made a, a whiskey up to 10% and you've got a thousand liters, then you should get a hundred liters of finished spirit. So that's a 2000 liter uh, fermenter. So we're gonna get 200 liters of finished spirit, which is not coincidentally how much we put in a barrel. So once we distill that all out, we've got a barrel of spirit and we're good to go. That's it's pretty intensive what you're doing there. You're, you're yeah, not, yeah. It's, it's so really I think what people um when people come here and they see the distillery and you know we're often kind of doing tours and, and talks and stuff, you see the romantic side of the distillery. Um but like distilling and especially on this kind of scale when actually we haven't spent hundreds of thousands of pounds on an automated system. I don't flick a switch and it 
pump stuff from one part of the distillery to another and then you know we're like lifting stuff and lugging it around it's like really kind of physically demanding so mm. um, yeah I often kind of pretty broken at the end of the day you know when we got a uh, we just brought some um some some raspberries and some spirit back to be distilled and um I'm going to be picking those up and wanging them in the still later on and you know it, that's it's all lifting and shifting around and pressing stuff yeah yeah brilliant that's uh fantastic that you've you so so hands-on down there can i just ask you a question about so when you started out with the, the distillery you obviously had this mission um and vision of of, of it being uh, sustainable and that's the journey which you're going on you're still on that journey it wasn't like day one we've solved all the problems we're carbon neutral so you, you've been on a journey. You've obviously been on a, a <laughs> that's quite a long journey to where you are now. Where do you have you think you've come from, or where you're going to? I mean, there must be a big, big difference, right? Yeah. Well, so I I, I bet there's a there's a few people um, that will be on this call that you know will have come up to one of our stands in the early days. Um, you know, three years ago when we were at some of our first trade shows, and I wouldn't have spoken about sustainability i would have spoken about our spirits and probably touched on the food waste aspect of what we're doing but back then i was i was building a sustainable distillery for my own purposes um i wanted to you know the the outside view of the distillery i wanted it to be the bottles look beautiful as a range and they taste amazing and each spirit is like world class within its own category um, but the more that people scratch beneath the surface and, and they realize, well, and the more I kind of realized and learned about the distillery as a whole, the dis distilling world as a whole, I realized that actually it's so unsustainable, mm. um, which I kind of knew, but like seeing all these other brands and, and people started to really respond to that. So it became, the more we talked about it and the more we marketed our brand, it became more of a thing about our distillery. Mm. And, it's, and for me, I don't like to go out there and like claim things. We don't do a lot of talking about where the first did this and we did that because I try to be a little bit humble. I mean, there's been generations of distillers that have come before us and we've not invented anything. We've not done anything really new, but from a sustainability point of view, I've been given um, a confidence to, to talk about it just from having it reflected back at me by, by people and by commentators and winning some awards and stuff like that. So it's, be, it's become um, more, more a part of, of what we do. And, and as you said, you, yeah, you're right. It's a never ending journey. You know, we, we kind of cleaned up on the sustainability awards last year, but I got a prediction about that, which is that we're, we're actually in this quite fortunate sweet spot where People are creating sustainable categories in, in awards because deserve, they deserve to be there. But for now, they're looking at the kind of breadth and the, the ethic of a distillery. And we kind of clean up because every single thing we do, every decision we make gets made with sustainability in mind. But if one of William Grant's distilleries or if, or if Bombay Sapphire, who another great sustainable distillery, if they make a, a change in, and, and they suddenly stop using 250 million liters of water, right? Not thousands. So I think some of these awards will start to pivot to magnitude of changes as opposed to we're doing everything, but on a relatively small scale, you know, relatively. So um, that, that'll be interesting to see how that goes. But yeah, it's a long journey for us. The big things for me this year were water use, salt use, um, and, and, and distribution in terms of the carbon intensity in our distribution. We've, we, we've, we've sorted the, the water and salt use in our cooling pond distribution. We're looking to partner with a distributor who is carbon neutral in, they, they are carbon neutral as are we. Um, but that's the one thing that the whole, the whole industry has to get together and, yeah. and, and, and yeah, Absolutely. deal with the distribution side. Absolutely. And briefly, um, are there any other distilleries who you particularly kind of look up to from any particular point of view from whether it's be the sustainability, whether it be from grain to glass, whether, it, you know, is, is there anybody who's really pushing the envelope on that kind of stuff at the moment? Yeah, I think, I think there are, and there's some, there's some other distilleries that are, that, that are doing things and, and, 
and quite, really quite quietly. So um, Ramsbury Distillery, um, I think they're Wiltshire. Um, they, they're doing quite a lot around sustainability. Um, Brindle Distillery doing a lot around sustainability. Um, our Bicky Distillery. Mm. Um, so there, there are there are quite a lot. Um, some of those are kind of being really choosy about how and 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 what they do, what they tackle, and and then sometimes it kind of falls apart. You're like, well, why have you used that? You know, why are you? Mm. If it, for me, it's kind of so deep in my DNA. Like our boxes are, I would never have a, a, a chlorine um, processed box. We would never ship our spirits in white boxes with all these colors on because you're using um, you chemicals to bleach all that, that cardboard and in, in, in the process. So why would you do that? But most distilleries have this filter of, of commerciality that you go through. So we want to be sustainable in loads of stuff, but actually we've got to be, you know, we've got to be really commercial. Well, for me, the, Actually, the, the the like I'm I'm not commercial guys, but um yeah, exactly yeah it, it it yeah that's how I think yeah absolutely no I, I agree with that absolutely um I've got a couple of cheeky questions here There's some bloke called uh, Charlie I think do do you distill naked is is what he's wanting to ask <laughs> we are I have to say this place is swarming in CCTV. Uh, and and if, a, if, an, if an accident did happen to me, I was like under a pallet like that forevermore. And, and someone reviewed the CCTV and I was naked from the waist down. I'm uh, not sure about that. Now, this is a food business um, and it's, it's quite a dangerous business. OK, so we're, mm. we're moving around really heavy stuff and often boiling liquids. Um, and I have I have been burned once on on the on the foot like well, I got splashed with hot li like liquid out the still and yeah it was really nasty so yeah no naked no naked stuff no. yeah absolutely not um, no, I, I I I completely agree with you about that it's a bit like working in the kitchen uh, without any clothes on be uh, rather now that um, I do do but <laughs> <laughs> okay um, it. Just briefly going back to the the whole um, sustainability thing, greenwashing. Do you think that there are brands out there which greenwash? And you can go as. How long have you got? Uh, well, let's keep it to two minutes, Will, and you can use whatever word you want. You can name anybody you want. Yeah, listen, greenwashing isn't the worst um, the the worst issue in our in our business. You know, like the. I've got more, funny enough, I get more wound up when I see like, uh, like uh, a little, a little town somewhere and they've got, they've made their distillery. And I know, you know, everyone knows it's contract still, but we, what you're doing is you're lying to your consumer. So that's when I get really wound up. Is any anytime you, the language is used cleverly to give the consumer the impression of something which obviously isn't happening. So that's the only time I, I get I get really wound up. Generally, I kind of think, well, marketing all is fair in love and war. Greenwashing, I I kind of feel that people are a bit scared, like the 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 danger of doing something and getting it wrong is is bad. But you know, I've seen a couple of websites where they've got um, you know a, a web page up, and it's you know we think about sustainability all the time. We recycle all our plastic. We use glass bottles because they're recyclable. And we're like, well, yeah, okay, you use glass bottles because they're recyclable and you recycle your plastic. Like, who doesn't? So um, maybe they've got a page up there for, for search engine optimization. There's, um, I think people are a, a little bit cagey about the sustainability, if I'm honest. People are making, if fair enough for people to make claims that they're, they're, they're green and, and they're doing all, all they, they want to on a sustainability point of view. I kind of get more wound up by production issues, actually. I get more wound up when, you know, you're, you're doing something incredibly unsustainable, like taking water from Iceland when it has no actual impact on your product at, at the end of the day, even though it's a great gin, like that's an incredibly unsustainable thing to do and it makes no difference to the product. So, but um, yeah. Great. Um, one last one before then we can um, announce the winner of the um, award for the words, the three words which we put in. We put in. Um, uh, what is the wick? You've your brewer, your distiller. You do lots of things creatively with drinks. What's the weirdest thing, Will, you've ever made? Distilled, brewed, whatever. 
Um, weird as well, I do think our plum brownie is a little bit out there. You'd never see a Slivovich or a plum brownie in the UK. Um, and, but I think, in, so we use this thing, we use this um, in our gin. This is actually a really key component in our gin. Way, way back in the day when I was just finding, going out there and finding things to infuse, I used to go for, for walks. In the autumn, this is really easy to find. Um, if you've got a really healthy forest near you, um, especially in the autumn, you see this stuff all over the place because uh, when the leaves are on the ground, this gets blown out of the trees in the kind of autumn storms and, uh, and it's bright, bright green on the forest floor. Um, this is oak moss um, and it, it grows on the, on the, on the branches of, of usually oak trees, but other, other things. It, it is a lichen, but it's called oak moss. It's used a lot in the perfume industry as a fixative, so it kind of binds flavors together. We don't use a traditional fixative in our gin, like you might use angelica or orris root. Um, this plays that role for us. But I used to go, and you, you can, if you go on a, a, on, on a walk and, and gather this from the trees, you don't want to overdo it because actually it, it, it doesn't grow in abundance in this country. You don't want to be stripping the ecology of things that are needed. Um, but you can, you know, get a few handfuls of this and put it in a kiln jar with some vodka and it makes the most amazing um, vodka, infused, infused vodka. So I used to make this um, and just, just drink it neat. Um, if you've had bison grass vodka, mm -hmm. um, yep. which is yeah quite a, quite a, a nice vodka, this is the kind of British version of of that um, oak moss vodka, and it's a really really beautiful spirit. So as a consequence, having played around this for years, I knew straight away that one of the forest components of our gin would be this oak moss, and so um, I'm using oak moss, hawthorn berries, and poppy seeds to give that kind of forest that kind of forest floor almost. This actually is more of a kind of hay like aroma um, but it is like that woodland botanical so those three botanicals for me are our forest and then the floral component I'm using honey um, and gorse flowers um, primarily and, and rose hips and then we're using bay leaves to kind of knit that green and that floral together and then loads of cob nuts underneath to give that silky texture that, that Arjun has. Yeah well that's that's pretty good. I, I need to come next time I'm down. I need to taste some of the vodka with that just as a single botanical. That would be really interesting to see if it is like uh, Zubroka. But Will, we've got to um, we've got to announce who the winner of the word challenge was, and someone picked up on it immediately after you said said it for the third time, and that gentleman is called. Andy Bracey. So there he is on the big screen. Give her, give him a round of applause. There we are. And the word was wang. I, I had to say we we're wanging down uh, to um, to Cornwall, and then there was a wanging and a wang. So well done on picking up that ridiculous word. Um, and a lot, I was amazed at how many people would were, were actually saying, "Is it?" competition is it squirrel is it this that and the other so i love the fact that people were aware that there was going to be some word but um wang it was and andy well done you'll there'll be a bottle wanging its way to you uh soon so you need to i think probably just pop your address into the chat or something like that and then we'll 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 wang a bottle uh, in the post um to you so congratulations on that thank you so much for everybody involved in this evening we have had an amazing evening i think um great to see that there are way over 60 people still online i think we've got up to 70 so we, we we've, we've we've kept everybody entertained hopefully and um i think we're going to thank josh again Thank Paul again. Thank um, our distributors, um, the Gin Kiosk, for getting everything out to people on time. Fantastic. Um, we've got another of these in a couple of weeks' time with uh, Tarquins, and we're going to go through a similar format, and there'll be um, different, different words you can pick up. So hopefully you can come back and um, be entertained by us again. Uh, I, th I think we're just going to keep this running. We've noticed in the past that um, people talk to each other so we're gonna, I think we're gonna unmute people um, and uh, we, people can talk to each other.
wave to each other, drink, drink with each other. Um, congratulations to the people who actually make made cocktails. I'm bloody impressed with how many cocktails there were produced. <laughs> yeah. Really, really good. Um, a really big thank you for everybody you. for attending. It's been fantastic. It's been really good fun uh, speaking to you. All. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Questions? I think I think a few of us are going to be sticking around, but. But we've noticed before people will talk and yeah, whether on the chat or between each other, that's all good. So thank you. Okay, thanks to you as well, Mark.